Okay, so this video is going to be your 101 basics guide with the intent to teach you the core concepts you need in order to effectively do a murder in Dead by Daylight. Everything from looping to pressure, when to drop chase, and even when you should probably be tunneling. So sacrifice that survival rule book and pray to Alt Starver because I'm ridiculously average and this is how you actually play killer. Now, this video applies to pretty much every killer in the game, so as long as it doesn't bend the laws of physics or is actively on crack, this guide is going to apply. However, I do not have the sufficient supply of f**ks to give in order to cover the nuances of every killer in a single tutorial, so subscribe! We'll be doing more videos for each killer individually, but for now, this guide is designed to get you up and running. So, if this is your first time playing killer, and you don't know where to start, pick one of these and you'll be fine. They're all great first picks with simple, capable kits, which is good, because when you first start out, your main focus should be mastering the core gameplay over learning how to play a war crime. As the killer, your gameplay revolves around buying as much time as possible in order to gain an advantage, as all killers start out with a massive disadvantage. At the start of the trial, you first have to find survivors, burn through their resources, and then proceed to do murder, while survivors have pallets, items, and perks all immediately available to try and disrupt you, reset your advantage, or speed through the game as quickly as possible. This means that as soon as you spawn in, you are racing against the survivors, because if you leave them alone, an efficient swift can power the exit gates in less than four minutes, leaving you stuck at a pallet being teabagged by a confused himbo with daddy issues. A lot of the killer community has come to call this gen rushing, but what it actually is is a simple of poor pressure and bad gen management. There are four survivors who all equally deserve your attention, and neglecting the rest of the team by overcommitting to a single player will often lead to situations where you give up way more pressure than you actually need to. So what is pressure exactly? Pressure is essentially everything you can do to be a pain in the ass for survivors, regressing gens, harassing multiple players at once, forcing them to heal and go for saves, or when a survivor inevitably dies. Turns out, the less survivors available to do objectives, either through you being distracting or them being deceased, the less time they can steal from you. With this in mind, whilst you are in chase, you are actively only pressuring a single survivor, meaning that if that survivor can keep you in chase, you aren't really doing a whole lot to impact the state of the game. Now, I know that for most new killers, knowing when to drop chase is challenging, and most of the time you won't due to ego or the sunken cost fallacy, but trust me when I say that there is no shame in swallowing your pride and admitting that a survivor has beaten you at looping, especially if you just go murder the rest of their team. Unfortunately, due to how each trial can vary wildly, this isn't something that I can actually teach you, but it is something that you will build the game sense for over time. What I can tell you is that you should never be reaching Bloodlust 2 in chase. Simply put, Bloodlust 2 takes 25 seconds to reach, and a single generator being done by two survivors takes 50. Rather find that gen and start harassing survivors that are actually doing something to actively win the game. This is called survivor priority, and essentially it just means who you should be turning into a statistic at any given time. Top of that list are survivors who are actively doing something something, and then the survivors who have been hooked the most, which is why it's a really good idea to keep track of hook states. If you're down three gens and get into a chase with a Felix you haven't seen all game, it's actually in your best interest to ignore them, as even if you do get them onto a hook, his teammates can choose to leave him hanging there in favour of doing gens, then going for a save when it best suits them. In contrast, if you manage to find the survivor who's dead on hook, their teammates either have to stop what they're doing and come play protect the president, or they're down a player, and for those of you who lack a fundamental understanding of mathematics and or play Fortnite, less survivors equals good. This brings us to the subject of tunneling, and yes, you should absolutely be forcing survivors out of the game if and when it is convenient to do so. If a survivor unhooks and you're within range to send them to Jesus, you are under no obligation to go stare at a corner for the next half a minute. They don't suddenly get a free pass because their teammate made an oopsie and they need time to get their life together. It's not personal survivor memes, so please stop taking it that way. I get that having teammates whose collective IQ couldn't amount to a hamsters is incredibly frustrating, but the thing is, there are no rules in this game that say that killers aren't allowed to camp, tunnel, or run no end, so it's up to you to play around these factors, and if that still manages to offend your sensibilities, well then I'm sorry. Finally scroll down to the comments and then maybe, if we're both lucky, you can find a fuck for me to gift to you. That being said, there is a right time to tunnel and there are times where it will outright cost you the game. If you can capitalize on a poorly thought out unhook or a survivor running straight into a dead zone without off the record, then great, but if you're spending two minutes over committing to someone just because they're dead on hook, it isn't worth it anymore. Knowing when to give up chase is very, very important, and over committing to someone just because they did a squat or committed the heinous act of shining a ray of light at your face is the fastest way to lose you that game. 
Conversely, if you're in the end game and you need to force an altruism play, you're actually better off prioritizing a survivor who hasn't been hooked yet because most players have that little voice in their head that goes, I could leave now and let my teammate die on hook, but that would make me a cunt. Abusing a player's sense of altruism is actually one of your strongest tools as a killer, which unfortunately makes camping occasionally very strong. You do have to remember, though, that whilst you're sitting there staring into the abyss of a Crawlette's nasal cavity, three other wonderful specimens of the human race are holding down left click, occasionally pressing spacebar, and probably disappointing their parents. Hook stages in Dead by Daylight take 60 seconds each, and two minutes spent doing nothing but intimately bonding is enough time to probably lose you the game, so please stop camping survivors to death at 5 gens. Proxying for a single hook state is fine, especially if you're able to defend other objectives at the same time, and if multiple survivors are playing for the unhook, you should absolutely make them work for it, but two minutes is a lot in this game. And in fairness, even though I reject the survivor rulebook, it is a massive dick move. Staring at a large sweaty man breathing heavily whilst you just hang there is appealing to very few people on this planet, and if you're playing Bubba, there is literally no counterplay other than making that player sit there longer. So yeah, there are times where it might be better to remember that this isn't a competitive of game and it's okay to play nice. Now, if you are playing nice in order to avoid learning a brand new language through racial slurs, you're probably going to end up defending a 3-gen, which as far as I'm aware is the strongest fair killer strategy in the game. So at the start of the match, look for three to four generators that are relatively close to each other and take note of where they are. This is going to be your late game fallback, and it's important that these remain untouched because trying to defend objectives at opposite ends of the map whilst all four survivors are alive is essentially impossible. Regularly check these generators because a good team will do everything they can to avoid getting three gen. And if survivors are swarming this area, it's very often worth it to ignore the other half of the map and use your perks to keep these gens low. Speaking of, the best perks for killer in this game right now are often the ones that either slow down the game or actively regress gens. And whilst I'm not here to tell you the magical perfect build to run on every killer, I will say that either Eruption or Pain Resonance are probably the strongest slowdown perks in the meta right now. Eruption working particularly well for 3 gen strategies because it can proc on multiple generators. 10% regression that forces survivors to do nothing for 25 seconds is busted, and after watching Thanatophobia get turned into a hashtag, this one's probably going to get nerfed, so abuse it now, thank me later. Other perks you want to be running is something to help you find survivors and something to help you in a chase. A good rule of thumb for newer players is two slowdown perks, one information perk, and one chase perk. Now you can obviously change this to suit your playstyle, for example on most killers I typically run no information perks, and on others I run exclusively aura reading, but here are three builds that are pretty simple and pretty versatile, so try them out and figure out what suits you. I'm running out of time for this video, and I can already feel my future fingers bleeding as I edit in the subtitles for this, so unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to teach you how to run every single loop in the game, as that on its own could be a four hour video, and last I checked, I'm only budget odd starver. So, here are a few core fundamentals on the tiles that I found to be the most obnoxious to deal with as a new player. The Killer Shack is arguably the strongest tile in the game for survivors, especially if it has connecting tiles that players can run to after they've dropped this pallet. My advice, don't loop here if you can afford not to. Survivors have a massive advantage in the structure and a good player can keep you busy for just long enough to let you reflect about the mistakes in life that led you here. If you have to loop Shack though, then chase entering from the pallet side. This forces the survivor to run wide in order to catch the fast vault or risk taking a medium vault. If you do this right, you are almost always close enough to either get a hit or double back and catch them on the outside side. Remember, as the killer, you are in control of the way a loop is run. If they drop Shack Pallet, kick it immediately. It's called God Pallet for a reason, and there is no way to catch Survivor here as long as it's still intact. One thing about pallets, by the way, just kick them. Unless you had a really short trash loop where you can get a hit on either side, they make for the strongest loops in the game. They can't be blocked by the entity and are often placed in ways that make them infinite. Don't waste your time mind gaming here or going for a bloodlust play. Just break it. Pallets are ultimately finite resources, and once they're gone, that's it. So it's okay to spend your time just burning through a survivor resource before getting back into chase. LNT walls are also really common and pretty annoying to deal with. Most killers try to go for mind games here by going along the outside wall and faking their red stain, but don't. Whilst this can definitely work, we're aiming for consistency over risk, and survivors can always just hold W and gain a ton of distance. The best way to run this tile is by running on the inside and shortening the loop. 
This forces the survivor to either double back with a medium vault or run at a really weird angle to try and keep the loop going, which will always gain you distance on them and eventually get you a hit. Now, like I said, I can't do every tile in the game right now, but these should give you the basics. Just remember that when you're looping, you want to shorten loops as much as possible, force survivors to take bad angles, break pallets whenever you can, and never let your survivor lead. I'm trusting you here to use what little brain power you might have to take this information and run with it. But if you do want to see a more in-depth guide where we go into more tiles and talk about mind gaming, let me know. Or go watch Spooky Loops. He has an amazing guide on looping and a beard that I would sell a kidney for. Well, that's it. I can't really teach you more basics without them not being basics anymore. I really hope you'll learn something here, and if there's anything major that you want to take from this, it's that your biggest possible waste of time is over committing to a single survivor. Your game is all about time management, so wasting time over committing is how you lose games. It's okay to drop chase and find somebody else to annoy, and as long as you're managing your time relatively well, you're gonna be fine. To all the survivor mains out there who may be watching this, I know it's rough right now. Behavior really screwed Solo Q over, and I really hope that they come up with a fix soon, but please remember that there is another human being behind that screen who plays killer, an actual person with a life and feelings. It's not their problem that you're having a bad time, and making them feel crap because of the way they play a game is not okay. So please, everyone, be kind to each other. Remember that you're all part of the same community, and you're all just trying to play a video game and have fun. Take a deep breath, say GG's, and hold your head up. Good luck and have fun. Thank you everybody so much for watching this video, it has been an absolute pleasure as it always is. If you enjoy this content, please do consider liking and subscribing, as it is a great way to either support me or keep up to date with the next videos that I may be posting, especially if this is your first time here. Massive shout out to my patrons, the people who managed to make this my livelihood right now, which is quite amazing. I can't believe that I get to say I do YouTube for a living. Moogle Boon, Matcha Seed, Rollin Wolfheart, and Snow T, you absolute fucking chads. As well as RDH3 Thunder, who subscribed at the highest possible tier, and is a pretty big part of the reason I get to do this as a job. If you want to subscribe to the Patreon and consider supporting me, the link is below. We do have benefits such as seeing the videos early, seeing my content and the, my workflow process, as well as coaching uh, specifically for killers within the game and all that beautiful thing. Plus, um, for some reason, an OnlyFans, so... <laughs> if you somehow want to see me dressed in lingerie, a link below. Other than that, guys, thank you so much for watching. It's been a pleasure, and I'll see you next week. Thank mm -hmm. you.